first emotions you hear when you think of Howard? Um, so when, when we finally got to work with him, because I worked, I won't say I worked with him. I worked kind of alongside him and, you know, worked on his songs on Little Mermaid. So I, I was like kind of aware of him, knew what he looked like, you know, said hello, all that. Um, on Beauty, we were not really aware that he was sick for yeah. a while because he that news didn't filter down to the rest of us. I mean, that was like executive level need to know kind of kind of information, and um, we were just kind of led to believe that oh, you know, Howard's this kind of prima donna that wants us to travel to New York all the time, yeah. not knowing that he was really too sick to travel. Um, when the information came out, it was like. God damn, you know, why didn't you say something? Yeah. We, you know, we, we, our attitude probably would have been different. Maybe not, but but it probably would have been different. I think it but, would have. Yeah, I think it would have. But the thing with Howard was he he was somebody, you know, I, I, I talk about, you know, the, the Broadway guys and, and the movie guys. Howard was both, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was somebody who lo who loved Broadway and, you know, was was – amazing at it but he also he liked he liked rock music he liked cartoons he liked bugs bunny you know he, he got the jokes that's why he was so good at the lyrics because he was so funny and loved the fun parts yeah. of cartoons he loved he loved cartoons and and that was something that was super rare um that we didn't <clears throat> we didn't often see in you know a lot of um you know of, of the music guys or or even writers sometimes you know they'll, they'll come in and they'll oh yeah okay i'm doing this animation thing it's really a springboard for my next big you know live action gig but um howard howard genuinely loved it and he was so funny i mean he was a lot of times he was kind of depressed mm. you know understandably but he, he's so funny and um but then the other thing, you know, then the, the yang to this yin is um, he, he could be really opinionated and really stubborn too. Yeah. And Kirk and I got into, a, you know, some spirited discussions with him on, on, on occasion. So one or two yeah. of them come to mind that aren't too personal that you might, wouldn't mind sharing with. Oh, all. I mean the, the one it, it's, I think it's even in, even in the, the, the doc um, is when um, Howard was very, uh, passionate about the idea that the beast was cursed as a child, mm -hmm. you know, like like a little ten, eleven year old kid, and and that the the duration of the course would go for like ten years, you know, until he's twenty one. So we thought well, that's that's awfully harsh, you know, for for um, you know the, the, a, a bratty little kid. And he suddenly turned into this monster, and everybody around him is also presumably, I don't know, magic, medieval, who knows. But, um, yeah. um, but, but we thought, okay, a, that's that's really that's really harsh, and and kind of seems kind of out of balance to what he did, saying, no, you can't stay here, because um, yeah. he's ten years old. You know, there's a stranger at the door. Um, B, we thought it was like kind of almost laughable and ridiculous that that when he turns into a beast and Howard had this vision that that he's like oh my god oh I'm a beast I'm cursed and he's running through the castle oh me woe is me and we, all we could picture was like Eddie Munster running around you know this little Lord Fauntleroy furry kid running around going oh no oh golly and, and we just thought this is not gonna fly and Howard did not care for that uh, <laughs> for that line of, uh, of, of argument um, there's a there's a, a a drawing a cartoon that Kirk did of, of Howard basically just torching <laughs> like literally breathing hey guys it's your host Julian this week I sit down with co-director for Disney's Beauty and the Beast The Hunchback of Notre Dame and Atlantis we chat all the early days and details about Beauty and the Beast and how Gary uh, kind of got to co-direct him we also talk about the late great Howard Ashman phenomenal playwright and a lyricist uh, for Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast and so much more. I hope you enjoy the episode. Gary, welcome to What's in My Head podcast, man. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. 
Yeah, no problem, man. Uh, I really appreciate you doing this because uh, these last few months, man, I've really been doing a deep dive uh, into Disney in specific because anybody my age range and probably younger, man, we kind of grow up on Disney, right? We, we, we are inundated with these beautiful movies that you guys so carefully and artistically put together. You guys create and then you put out for the world for us to really grow up. A lot of people grab their moral compass off of movies, cartoons, TV shows, comic books, anything that we grew up and we kind of mold ourselves off of what we're seeing on, on TV or on the big screen. And with a lot of these movies, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Gary's worked on directing, excuse me, co-directed uh, Beauty and the Beast, man, Atlantis, and then Hunchback. Um, three heavy hitters, right? Especially Beauty and the Beast starting off, you know, you're coming off of that Little Mermaid that tidal wave, no pun intended, well, fuck it, pun intended, the tidal wave of Little Mermaid, you know, really putting the ball into motion for the golden age, the renaissance of uh, animation. Um, so I got to imagine, dude, during that time, you guys post Little Mermaid, you're working Beauty and the Beast. Uh, do you remember where you're at when you get that call? Says, hey, Gary, man, we'd like you to co-direct Beauty and the Beast. We got the story for you. Oh, yeah. Um, it, <laughs> we were not, Kirk and I, Kirk, my co-director, mm -hmm. Kirk Wise, um, we weren't the studio's first choice. You know, we, we were, um, uh, Kirk and I and, and several other uh, people, we were in, they called it development. Mm -hmm. um, development back then was a lot different than, than you see in studios now where there's people like reading scripts and books and, you know, making deals and all that. Back then it was like daycare. You know, it, it, was, um, it was where they put people that they didn't have a current assignment for them but they didn't want to fire him yet either. So we were put in development. So Kirk and I were in there and we had done, um, we had just come off of like a month or two, two months. Yeah. It was in October when it finished. Um, a, um, um, a little, a little project for um, Epcot for um, it was called the wonders of life pavilion. Mm -hmm. And it was this, this little attraction called cranium command. And Kirk and I kind of stumbled into that, um, doing the the, the pre-show like animation thing that they put up um, in in the line in the lineup area, so people can kind of get an idea of what's gonna you know what the ride's gonna be like and what they're you know can expect to see, and it also keeps them entertained so they don't riot. <laughs> um, so so we did a little four and a half minute thing there. Then we kind of rewrote and redesigned the main show. The Jerry Reese uh, directed and we came off of that and we kind of thought okay well that was fun and it you know people liked it and back to back to daycare we go and we were um, I was working on uh, I think Kirk might have been too we we're working for a couple of weeks on Goofy of the Apes it was you know going to be Tarzan with Goofy mm -hmm. and um, we got the call from our boss on a Monday morning, this is like beginning of December. Now we got a call from our boss. He come into my office. Can you guys be on a plane on Wednesday to New York? You might get to direct Beauty and the Beast. And we were like looking around, you know, for the candid camera. We, we thought we were being pranked um, because it was, um, it had been in, in production for like a year already in London. Um, and apparently, uh, there had been a falling out with the studio and the directors and, and they wanted to go in a new direction. And the first two directors or, yeah, it was, it was a, a couple of guys that they asked before and for whatever reason they passed or the studio passed. And so they got to, to Kirk and myself. And so, yeah, it was like, we, it was like Dorothy opening up the door and stepping out into a hurricane, you know, we just like, woo, off we went Monday morning, first thing. With with you, you said it was uh, in production for almost a year now at that point. Uh, yeah. When you get first day, what's it like? I mean, you, you guys are co-directing this movie. So I got to imagine, how old are you? If you don't mind me asking, how old are you at that time? I think I was uh, 29. Jesus Christ, dude. 29. Kirk, I, I've, uh, Kirk's a year younger. I, I've said this on so many occasions. I, I think Aaron... Aaron Blaze, he might have said he was barely 27 when he did Brother Bear. Um, you oh, know, Aaron was a kid when he worked for us. I mean, it, he and, go, yeah, go and ahead, his brother ahead. Travis, it's like, holy crap, we pulled him out of middle school for this. 
it, it's it's crazy to think a huge production like Disney, Disney animation. And it's it's not like I'm saying you guys are kids and, and like young people, because my favorite animator of all time, Gany Tartakovsky, right? Everybody that I've ever talked to that's worked with this man has said the same thing so far ahead of his time this he like what he knew it in his 20s i'm pretty sure when if and when i have him on which i'm, I'm hoping i will one day but uh he, i've heard him say he's like i didn't know shit and then he was like everybody that worked with him he's like this dude is so far ahead of his time this guy knows this he knows this he's like well he's pushing all of these envelopes he's pushing all of these boundaries but to know that disney animation is kind of giving you guys the reins to a huge movie like obviously you never know what movie is going to be big before or out until after it's released you never know because yeah. things will pop and that you think wouldn't pop and then things won't pop that you was like oh this is i thought this was a home run i thought this was a setup you know so it, it's it's always interesting to see but knowing that such a young age to have something like this i got to imagine and it's come up so many times with the animators and story storyboard artists writers voice actors imposter syndrome did any of that set in? Did it feel like you were being, obviously you said the candid camera when you got pulled in the office, but when you get on there on that set that first day, what are some of the emotions you're going through? What are some of the things you're looking at? What are you feeling like? Do you remember? I got to imagine yeah, I you mean, do. Well, I mean, so like, like I said, Charlie put us on a plane, Charlie, our boss, and uh, you know, flew us to New York. This was also my first time to New York. You know, I'd never, mm. I'd never been to New York before. So it's winter um <laughs> and we're we're in uh like midtown you know, at the, the disney building and so we get there and in the room is howard ashman and alan Mankin and linda wolverton who had you know that was the team that was put together to write um the the book the the music and you know the composition and don hahn our producer um brian mcintee who was the art director Brenda Chapman um, and her future husband, Kevin Lima, Chris Sanders, uh, I believe Sue Nichols was there. And I said Chris, right? Chris Sanders? Yes. Yeah. 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 I think, I think that was it. And we sat around the table, you know, basically we were given the instruction, whatever they did before in London, it's out. We're keeping the title. That's it. Wow. You know, I mean, so, um, in you know some of the more well-known versions of it, particularly the uh, the Jean Cocteau version from the from the 40s, um, Bell had a couple of sisters, like evil sisters, and and they all had suitors, and <clears throat> and um, Howard kind of threw those out and condensed you know all of these all these these kind of dickhead suitors into uh, one guy Gaston, mm -hmm. um, and just pitched the sisters over the side. And it was there that, you know, we kind of came up with the idea, um, you know, we're, we're, we're like thinking what, what's been done before. The Cocteau version is, is, of course, the most famous one. Yeah. And the, the castle with, you know, the mysterious magical stuff, you know, all of her wishes would be, uh, would be attended to when she would walk down the, uh, uh, the darkened hallways, the, the, the candelabras would light and they would darken as she passed. And, you know, it was, it was really cool looking. And that's kind of what the what the London animated version looked like as well, um, and just wasn't that exciting, you know? It wasn't that fun. So we said, well, why don't we why don't we make the you know all these all these objects these magic objects? Why don't, why don't we give them personality? Why don't we make them characters? So that that came out pretty much first day, um, and then we just you know just ran from there. Howard had already kind of figured out the. Um, um, the placement of the first song of, um, of, of Bell's, you know, little yeah. town. And um, Alan had this, this shitty little Yamaha electric piano and, you know, he'd play that and Howard would sing. And we were just like, Holy cow. I mean, it was, it was even at that, like really rudimentary stage, it was like, this is really good. Yeah. I'm not a Broadway guy. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not a big fan of musicals and this was like seriously good. Did so what I've learned through doing this podcast, and if I keep looking down, I've got notes that I want to hit because uh, there's 
especially with this movie, there, there's a name that I want to bring up and, and you've mentioned them just a second ago, Howard. So I want to put a pin in that and circle back to that one, because I think that's very important. Um, but you said yourself, you're not, you're not into, you weren't a musical guy. Are you a musical guy now? I don't, I'm no, not trying to set you up. No, okay. Not really. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so. I was, I, I, I've told people that's kind of my dirty little secret is like, I, there's like two or three musicals that I kind of, I'm okay with, but mostly I don't really like them that much. And it, kind of was a you know it was a joke almost because kirk more so than me but not that much and kirk and i saw eye to eye on a lot of things and we would communicate you know in a certain way and then howard and alan and then later you know for um, for hunchback uh Stephen and alan mm -hmm. they had their own method of communication and their own ref frame of reference so they'd be talking about oh this scene it's just like in Gigi or oklahoma or annie get your gun and we'd be like you know just glowing question marks floating above our heads and and it, like either Kirk or myself would go, oh, you mean like you mean like Magnificent Seven or Terminator or you know just like two different worlds. And fortunately, the collision of these two worlds was was fairly friendly and benevolent. Oh, that's good, man. I'm I'm glad I'm glad that because uh, there's it's uh, it, it's always interesting to see you know how two worlds. I mean, Beauty and the Beast. It's two worlds coming together. So it it just it's kind of cool to see that. You know, you had your musical and theater guys over here, and then you guys had your blockbuster movies, film, I know this stuff. And then you guys have the conduit, you're working on the same movie, Beauty and the Beast, and you guys through movies, even though it's them talking music, you guys talking movies, you guys find a way to gel, you guys find a way to come together because Beauty and the Beast is one of the most beautiful movies I've ever seen. And up until I had Aaron and Tom Cito both on, I did not know that there was three different beasts during this like i watched the movie and I'm, I'm having fun and then aaron brought it up and he was like if you go back and you watch that movie he was like we tried to stay on model as best we could he was like there's three different beasts in there there's a couple different bells he was like you'll see the model sheets going all over the place so like i said it, it's a it's a beautiful movie i really enjoy it and it's something that i revisit um the song gets me every single time i tear up it's it's that's what i wanted to circle back to specifically but How howard ashman have you gotten a chance to see the docu documentary or docu series that they did yeah, on the, the one that Don did? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It was on uh, Disney plus. I saw it a, a few months back. Um, fucking breathtaking for one. It was beautiful. I mean, to know that he was taken I, and I got him pulled up here, like I said, cause I had, I had some notes written down very rarely. Do I ever read notes? I try to just, you know, shoot from the hip the best that I can, but for something like this, I think it's very important. Uh, the man was 41 when he died. I mean, to know that he was 41, do you remember, because he died March 14th, I can't remember when Beauty and the Beast came out, um, but do you remember if he got to see the movie in its final final stages before? He didn't. He didn't. No. We, we were close. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, were, we were fairly close. So he saw it in enough of a state where it, it didn't take too much imagination to fill in the blanks. You know, it was like some stuff needed to be colored. There were probably some scenes that were... Um, that were still in storyboard, but had like final dialogue, mm. you know, the final actors in and everything. So we were pretty close, when, but he never saw, he never saw the full thing. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure now that, now that you said that I'm like, I'm not, nah, fuck, I shouldn't have brought that up because I was like, I saw that in the documentary. I was like, Julian, you idiot. You, you remember that. It's just, it's hard to try to keep all yeah. of the facts up here, but thank you for, for breaking that down. Um, something that I love to do <clears throat> um, when people that are a huge part of anything that we love are no longer here. Um, I like to keep the memory alive. You know, I've done this with uh, James Avery, you know, uh, famous for um, Uncle Phil on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is also the voice actor for the first Shredder in the Ninja Turtle movie. Huge Ninja Turtle fan back here, Gary, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> um, the fans on, on YouTube, you know, they like pointing out all the Ninja Turtle stuff. Um, you know, we've done it with Tuck Tuckerson, a uh, huge storyboard artist for Nickelodeon, you know, so we've done it a few different times. Um, but do you have, I mean, I can imagine you worked pretty close with them for quite some time, but do you have any fun stories or whenever you hear the name Howard, I mean, what's the first thought, you know, we're talking Howard Ashman, ladies and gentlemen. Um, what's the, some of the first thoughts or some of the most first emotions you hear when you think of Howard? Um, so when, when we finally got to work with him, cause I worked, I won't say I worked with him. I worked kind of alongside him and, mm -hmm. you know, worked on his songs on little mermaid. So I, I, I was like kind of aware of him, knew what he looked like, you know, said, hello, all that um on beauty we were not really aware that he was sick for
for yeah. a while because he that news didn't filter down to the rest of us. I mean, that was like executive level need to know kind of kind of information. And um, we were just kind of led to believe that, oh, you know, Howard's this kind of prima donna that wants us to travel to New York all the time, yeah. not knowing that he was really too sick to travel. Um, when the information came out, you know, it was like, God damn, you know, why didn't you say something? Yeah. We, you know, we, we, our attitude probably would have been different. Maybe not, but, but it probably would have been different. I think it but, would have. Yeah, I think it would have. But the thing with Howard was he, he was somebody, you know, I, I talk about, you know, the, the Broadway guys and, and the movie guys. Howard was both, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, he was somebody who, lo who loved Broadway and, you know, was, was, amazing at it but he also he liked he liked rock music he liked cartoons he liked bugs bunny you know he, he got the jokes that's why he was so good at the lyrics because he was so funny and loved the fun parts yeah. of cartoons he loved he loved cartoons and and that was something that was super rare um that we didn't <clears throat> we didn't often see in you know a lot of um you know of, of the music guys or or even writers sometimes you know they'll, they'll come in and they'll oh yeah okay i'm doing this animation thing it's really a springboard for my next big you know live action gig but um howard howard genuinely loved it and he was so funny i mean he was a lot of times he was kind of depressed hmm. you know understandably but he could be so funny and um but then the other thing, you know, then the, the yang to this yin is um, <laughs> he could be really opinionated and really stubborn, too. Yeah. And Kirk and I got into, a, you know, some spirited discussions with him on on, on occasion. So one or two yeah. of them come to mind that aren't too personal that you might wouldn't mind sharing with. Oh, them. I mean, the, the one it, it's I think it's even in even in the, the, the doc um, is when um, Howard was very. Uh, passionate about the idea that the beast was cursed as a child, mm -hmm. you know, like like a little 10, 11 year old kid. And, and that the, the duration of the course would go for like 10 years, you know, until he's 21. So we thought, well, that's, that's awfully harsh, you know, for, for, um, you know, the, the just a, a bratty little kid, and he suddenly turned into this monster and everybody around him is also presumably, I don't know, magic, medieval, who knows. But, um, yeah. um, but, but we thought, okay, A, that's, that's, really, that's really harsh and, and kind of seems kind of out of balance to what he did saying, no, you can't stay here because um, yeah. he's 10 years old. You know, there's a stranger at the door. Um, B, we thought it was like, kind of almost laughable and ridiculous that that when he turns into a beast and Howard had this vision that that he's like oh my god oh I'm a beast I'm cursed and he's running through the castle oh me woe is me and we, all we could picture was like Eddie Munster running around you know this little Lord Fauntleroy furry kid running around going oh no oh golly and and we just thought this is not gonna fly and Howard did not care for that uh, <laughs> for that line of uh, of, of argument um there's a there's a uh a, a drawing a cartoon that kirk did of of howard basically just torching <laughs> like literally breathing fire um on us and yeah it was it was kind of like that oh that's that's cool thank you for sharing those stories and like i said i like bringing those up because you know somebody like somebody like howard his his name his career i mean his legacy will live forever because Disney is not going anywhere, yeah. but there's a lot of fans that I've noticed. Um, you know, when I started this podcast, it was originally just to talk Ninja Turtle stuff with people. A whole bunch of stuff didn't line up. I felt like I might typecast myself and run out of people eventually to talk to, which I ran out of people the first time I tried to get somebody on. Um, so I kind of opened it up to everything that I like. I love movies. I love comic books. I love cartoons. I love animation, you know? So it's why it's a catch all, man. It's why it's called the what's in my head podcast, because there's so much shit bouncing around. I mean, I love, I love, I love sports. I love me the NBA. I mean, I'm a huge, huge Orlando magic fan. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's when I started doing this and I started hearing the stories that, you know, the people that I looked up to that I've always wanted 
that I'd never get because they're no longer here. Um, I noticed that a lot of those fans, that might be their first time hearing a story about them. And they might go, oh, shit, I've never heard that name. Why do I, why do I not know that name? They're talking about him for the last 10 minutes. Let me Google him like, oh, shit, he did all of this, and he did this, and he did this. And then we make a fan out of somebody that might not have stumbled upon that person yeah. by themselves. So that's why I really enjoy this. You know, like I said, their legacy is cemented. I'm just trying to help immortalize them here as well, man. So thank you for sharing those stories. Um, now, getting back to Beauty and the Beast, I got to imagine that 29 years old, you're probably freaking the fuck out. You're like, uh, the fuck is going on? And they put me, put me and Kirk over here with directors. He was like, ah, I, you know, I got to imagine all of those emotions. You got all of this shit going on in your head. You're probably stressed. Um, so what were some of the things that when you first got on, you and Kirk, obviously you guys are working pretty much from a brand new script. Nothing really stayed other than the name is what you said. Um, so what are some of the first things you guys are trying to implement? You know, how are you talking to the team? What are you guys saying to the team? What are you guys trying to do to keep the, mo well, I guess it wasn't really momentum since it was a shift change, but what are you guys trying to do to, progress the momentum with you guys coming on board one of the first things i noticed is like i'm i'm not one of the guys anymore you know because yeah. i used to, like with with the story crew i used to be in the story crew i used to work side by side with all these guys mm -hmm. and would joke around with them and suddenly I, you can't joke around so much anymore because mm -hmm. people will take you literally you know yeah. hey wouldn't it be funny if they did this and somebody goes and draws it up you know, no 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 wait minutes you know so you have to you have to kind of like you have to be careful what you say um but it was uh, and we had you know a, a little bit of a rough stretch with with the writer who was a live action writer mm -hmm. and like i said some writers don't really like animation and it was clear that the animation was was not her her favorite medium you know and and uh so we you know and I, actually howard was howard turned into like our, our writer he he was the one who really um you know gave us gave us like the the roadmap of where the story wanted to go um but it was um i mean we were kind of the tail end of the time when um when a lot of the story was was worked out by the storyboard crew it was this was before script really became the king at disney animation before this um, storyboard crews would get like an outline, maybe a few a uh, few pages of dialogue, but basically an outline and say, "Here you go, figure it out." You know, and then it would be all be worked out on the storyboards in an editorial. And to have a, a writer come in and say, "No, you have to you have to storyboard my words. You have to do my, uh, you know, my you you have to do my pages. You're not allowed to to, to like riff or or embellish or anything." So there there was a you know a little bit of this going on. So, so that was one of the things we had to had to contend with was a story crew that had one idea and and a writer that had another idea, you know, for the arc of the story, for the character personalities, you know, for a lot of things. Just try. I mean, we've described directing before as like running a, alongside like a runaway car and just like trying to like trying to keep it from, ro you know, rolling up on the sidewalk, you know, and, and, yeah. and, and take it out to people. You're just. You're just trying. You're just trying to keep it, keep it on track. You know, you don't ever really feel like you're in the driver's seat. You're just kind of running along, kind of nudging it when when you can. I would love to see that animated. You guys run side by side with a locomotive, beast driving that, being that conductor, and you. Well, guys... there's there's a whole bunch of there there are a whole bunch of metaphors. You know, the 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 circus performers trying to keep all the plates spinning. You know, and like one of them gets bubbled. Oh, you gotta run over there and do that one and. Yeah, that's that's when production really gets going, and and you've got all the plates spinning. You got storyboard, you got you got animation, you got cleanup, you got effects, you got layout, you got camera. You got, just like oh god, you know, that's why there were two of us because you know both of us were were brand new at this, and there was a ton of work to do. That that year that um, that it spent in London didn't didn't get magically put on the end of our. Uh, schedule that that year was gone from our from our production schedule so the, you know the end date was still the same so we that's, were we were doing like wild. a, a three-year movie in two years that that's so insane and there was something that uh, i wanted to circle back to 
that you had said you, you and this i think you're the first director not the first director that had on but the first director that I've had on this brought this up was like you went from being one of the guys to like oh shit i have to really be careful because if i say hey it would be cool and it's funny you bring something like so I, like i told you before we hit record most fans already know that i cook for a living right so the the chef i work for best chef i've ever worked for in my life man so he'll he'll come over and i'll be working on a recipe and he'd be like you know it'd be really good if we did such and such in there and then i was like yeah that would be cool you know the next week where i'm doing that same that same dish i'm, and I'm, I'm making a, I, I think the flashback i was like oh he said brown butter would be good in this instead of regular butter so i'd do brown butter and he came over and tasted it. he's like do you put brown butter in this and i was like yeah because last week you said hey that'd be wouldn't it be cool if we did this and he was like yeah but i didn't mean that and i was like well, dude, I didn't know if this is one of those things where you're trying to drop some hints and you're being non-confrontational about this shit, or if you're just fucking talking to talk. And he was like, well, I was just talking to talk. And I was like, well, shit, man, I'm following you because you're the goddamn leader here. Right. <laughs> so right. I, it, it, it's funny how it's funny how that shit happens and uh, it comes up in everybody's life, really. Um, but uh, with you being the guy that's running the show or one of the guys that's running the show uh, and you're in charge of this movie that a, a year is cut from you guys is you can guys just rip, like you said, rip it off your calendar. You guys, two years and three years. Um, what is the feeling like from the crew? I mean, did you guys feel like you were under the gun, under the pressure, under the fire, whatever metaphor euphemism you want to use? Did it feel like it? You know, the, the crew was really supportive. Now, and that's, and the thing is when we got put into this position, um, Jeffrey Katzenberg, the, you know, the, the head, of Disney mm -hmm. at the time said, well, you guys, you guys are new at this, you know, you guys, you guys are, you know, kind of raw recruits at this. So you're not going to be officially directors. You're, you're just acting directors, mm -hmm. you know, until, until you prove yourself. And so for the first six months, okay. we were acting directors, you know, mm -hmm. and Kirk's joke was, well, we better start acting like directors then. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, so, you know, for the first six months, the crew was totally behind us. They were like, yeah, all right, let's, let's go. The, again, the writer was like, well, I don't have to listen to them because they're not real directors, you know? So, so again, friction. Um, but I mean, it all, it all worked out. It, it, it all, it all came together, but um, yeah, I mean, it's it, the, the, the support that we had from the crew, from Don, um, you know, the, the producer, who had produced before, but not a lot, because yeah. he was, he, you know, he was still, you know, just getting into this as well. But um, yeah, I mean, could not have done it without without the backing of these guys. That's really cool to hear, man. Because you know, I heard the same thing from Aaron. He said, "Everybody above me, everybody below me, man." It was super supportive because he was like, they saw how stressed I was. He was like, I was just. He's like, nobody goes out to you know he doesn't say this i'm paraphrasing but i mean uh nobody goes out to make something shit you know everybody wants to do their best and everybody thinks that if they input they're giving their best as well you know so it's really cool to hear both up and down the ladder of that chain of command that every, everybody was really supportive of you guys because like i said 29 is very young especially when you're in a multi-million dollar industry you're a multi-million dollar movie and you're only what two years removed from little mermaid um and you know just to flush out or finish that that point i brought up about being the guy that's kind of you know asking and telling people what to do um how much did you work on i i should have looked this up a little bit more in depth but how much did you work on for little mermaid i know you said you did some stuff with little mermaid earlier um i did i did boards so yes. um god i can't remember like time wise Time is funny with it with animation people, and you, you'll find this with, with other people as well. We don't think in years; we think in productions. You know, mm -hmm. it's like oh, that was three years ago. It's like no, that was back on Rescuers Down Under. You know, it's like <laughs> people. That's how our brains work. Um, so, Mermaid. I mean, I know it was on a probably a year, but yeah. but maybe not quite that long. But yeah, I did my my claim to fame on that was I I storyboarded. Um, the the chef song you know with chef louis when and, and the crabs running around in the kitchen like trying not to be killed so um but also worked on a number of other songs like in conjunction with um on the storyboard team roger allers was on was was boarding with me um ed gombert um those 
those were those were the the guys that I that I worked with the most. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there there were there are other story people as well. But um, yeah, I mean, oh God, what um, the 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 dingle hopper, you know, the, yeah. the the fork coming to hair, um, exploring the sunken wreck, um, Ursula's Ursula's song and and the deal. Um, Rest in peace, Pat Carroll, as well. That was yeah, God, that's just what two days ago, three days ago. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It, the same day we lost Bill Russell, a Boston Celtics legend. Been, Bill Russell, uh, Paul Coker Jr. Um, I mean, a whole bunch of people like yeah. all at once. And Nich uh, what was it, Nichelle Nichols? Um, or Nichelle uh, Nichols, yeah, yeah, uh, from from uh, Star Trek. So, um, you know, so it was a it was a fuck man. Bad you, week. You could, yeah, it really was, man. It's a real sad day. It was just one right after the next. Um, you know, uh, the only reason I brought up The Little Mermaid, though, uh, because you went, like I said, you went from being one of the guys to directing the guys and the gals. Um, did you get a chance to work with Glenn Keane over, uh, on Little oh, Mermaid yeah. at all? Um, not so much work with him. I mm. mean, he, he worked on scenes that I boarded. and yeah. But, I mean, we never really, like, collaborated on it i think at the very end you know when we were trying to figure out what do we do for this ending you know the big finale where they they finally decided to uh spear ursula with a ship mm -hmm. um glenn was in we, we were all like sitting in a, like a round table like throwing ideas out and i think that was glenn's idea you know and and he ultimately boarded that but um for the rest of it i mean he was animating and we were boarding and and we didn't we didn't uh we didn't meet that much the only reason i bring it up is because one i, I put I'm, I'm so glad gary i'm gonna have to have have you back on if you're having fun man i'd, I'd love to have you back on because i un, we're not even going to get to the other two movies there's no way in, 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 in you know hour a short hour i can cover you guys entire career because like i said you think of productions you don't really think of years and i mean just in that one production is two three years of your life you know it's kind of hard to cover you know two months of your life when you're doing something like this like like a movie like this um so i'd love to have you back on man um uh that scene where they kill ursula at the end uh i equate that scene as far as what's the word i'm looking for it's not legacy but it's like just definitive like that scene right there i put that up with the water scene for pinocchio like when I think of like Disney and I think water, you know, you could probably say Nemo and stuff like that, but I kind of still keep them separate, even though they're under the same umbrella of Disney. You know, I think of like water scenes. I think of the Ursula. I think of, you know, the, the, what was it? The cyclone or whatever it is. There's everything coming together where she's speared, right? With the Triton or with the ship, excuse me. Um, yeah. You know, so yeah it, it, yeah thank you the mess uh but is that and then the pinocchio scene the underwater scene i think of like those are the first two thoughts that come into mind now working with glenn keen um and then he's coming over and he's doing beast he's lead animator on beast or is it supervising animator on beast yeah he was he was the soup on, on beast okay you know so he's also got aaron he's also got tom so they they, they had some cool stories so i got to imagine just getting to watch him work. I mean, I, I love, there's a couple people, him, Eric Goldberg, I absolutely love, like I'll put on videos and it's like Bob Ross, you know, Mr. Rogers. It's, it's like something that's inviting, you know, it's, they're not going out of their way to be humble or charming or, you know, luring you in or anything like that. It's just their natural presence of their love and their master of their craft. When you see somebody that is the height of their craft, I've said this so many times to fans, I apologize, but you see somebody at the height of their craft and you see how easy, not easy, but how, how much ease it is for them, I guess, or how natural everything looks. And then they have a way of talking to you where they're bringing you into this process of what they're doing and they're explaining things. You don't feel you don't feel like that person that gets invited to a party that your friend's not, you know, he's, he's like, Hey, this is my friend, Gary, or, Hey, this is my friend, Julian. So he's not inviting you to people. So that's what I get when I listen to those two guys. So I got to imagine when you get them on beauty and the beast, I got to imagine you, you knew you had, you know, one of the greatest animators oh, yeah. at that point, I got to imagine. Right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, there, th that was one of the things about beauty was it was the last film at, at Disney studios that was just on a single track but after that the studio decided to do like two films at once you know so there was a parallel track going so instead of like 
one film every two or three years would be like one film every year like mm -hmm. every year there'd be something new coming out and so this was the last year that we had like the single film so we had everybody all the good people we had um and i mean it was like it was like the the, the all-star dream team which after that never happened again because you know then it then it broke off into you know like like the ringling circus you know you got the, you got the red train and the blue train and and you know you kind of wave to each other you know at, at the commissary and you, you go to each other's screenings and things like that yeah. but but the, they, honestly yeah you you sometimes you get called into a meeting oh we're having some trouble with with this uh you know with this scene or this idea does anybody have any idea you know and you have like a gag session or you know th things like that but mostly it's like okay there goes there goes uh there goes glenn or there goes um there goes nick i mean yeah. nick was one of the ones we worked with on beauty and then whew, he's off to ron and john land and uh we i don't think we worked with him again um I, the bancrofts i think were like that as well yeah. so yeah i mean it was it, it was a big deal having having glenn on board um along with Mark Han and, and James Baxter and Andreas and, you know, all, all these other like big guns. Um, the funny Glenn story that we have. Ooh. Um, yeah. <laughs> so the scene in Beauty and the Beast, when Belle is in the prison with her father, you know, it's like, and, and the beast comes out of, out of the shadows and she's like, oh my God, he reveals himself in the light. Number one, it's, it was never as dark as we wanted because, you know, the, the studio was like, oh, you know, it's too dark. We can't see anything. So it, it wasn't as mysterious as we would have liked it, but it still worked OK. Um, but Glenn, had, I mean, he was like this perfectionist and I guess almost a method actor, you know, cause, so he went to um, he went to the Los Angeles Zoo and there was the the gorilla exhibit. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, and um, so he came back. And he animated the beast based on what he had seen with, you know, with, with this gorilla. There's this new, there's, they've got this new silverback gorilla. And he's back and forth inside of his cave. And you can just barely see him in the door. And he's going back and forth, back and forth. And everybody's waiting for him to come out. And what's he going to look like? And so he, that's how he animated the beast. Just like a oh, back and wow. forth, back and forth. And then just like, but a scene that was supposed to be about... I don't know, a second and a half long when he when he comes out. Glenn animated almost 20 seconds of this thing. Just like we're like at the Kirk and I are like, what do we do? It's Glenn Keane. We can't what do we do? And Don said, I'll 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 handle this, you know. And so so Glenn fixed it, you know, and it and it it became what it is. But he had had the beast just like walking back and forth and not saying anything, just like just like <laughs> <laughs> kind of brooding back in the shadows and, and turning his back and looking around and it's like get to the point man let's, let's see let's see this but um yeah i mean it was it was intimidating because you know here's here's kirk and i it's like hi we're the acting directors and uh <laughs> and there's glenn Keane and his gorilla so but now, it all again it all worked out don don Hahn to the rescue that that's <laughs> I got to imagine, man, it's, it's what, what I wouldn't say, I don't want to say it's the word intimidating, but what was it like trying to navigate? You've got, like you said, that's, that's Glenn Keane, you know? So what is it like you being a young guy? I, I hate to quit. I hate to keep bringing it back to age, but I know what I was like just a couple years. I mean, I'll be 33 next Saturday. So I know what it's like to be young and then you look up to somebody, you meet somebody or you've worked with somebody and you've heard so many stories about like, wow, that person is so great. And you get to work with them. You, you kind of get starstruck a little bit. You know, you don't know what to say. It, you know, I had that a lot when I started working at the restaurant I work at now. You know, the, the chef I work for came from a, an outstanding pedigree. So it was like not intimidating in a sense, but it definitely took, you know, some warming up to as far as coming from me. And this is this is right after COVID, right? So we all got sent home in COVID. I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, I didn't know if I was ever going to cook again, you know, so I was kind of jaded when I came back to the restaurant, you know, and uh, do you, do you ever watch cooking shows or anything like oh, yeah. that? Yeah. Um, if you have Hulu, you should check out the show. It's called the bear. Uh, just the drop bear? the bear. Yes. I've heard of that. I haven't seen it. It is probably the best show of this year. That's going to win so many awards this year. 
Um, I don't vote for any of these awards or anything like that, but it's, it's, it's so well done. I mean, Maddie Matheson, Chef Maddie Matheson's producing it. So everything from how they're cutting stuff to how they're talking, there's some little things here and there. This is the most kitchen accurate show I've ever seen in my life. I've heard that. I, I have um, heard that about it. Yeah. So, you know, so I see this, right. And then I'm like, oh shit, this is exactly what it was like. Cause we both came back to this restaurant, you know, it was after COVID. So a lot of things had happened. The restaurant had just slipped into a shithole. Um, you know, so we came in and we're the first two there on the ground and we're literally just trying to resurrect this thing from the ashes. So watching the show and seeing all this stuff, I'm like, fuck dude, I was kind of, you know, and I was a dick. I sucked it when I first got back, I was super jaded you know, it was very cancerous at first. And I'm like, this dude kept on it, man. He kept coming back. He kept wanting to show me stuff. He didn't give up on me. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. But seeing that in the show, but like I said, and how I draw that correlation was just, I got to imagine it's pretty intimidating, at least for me, I know it would be to have somebody like Glenn Keane, right? So at what point, obviously, like you said, you're coming from Little Mermaid, you got to see him a little bit, but at what point did you start to realize like, oh, that's like Glenn. It's not just hey man, it's Glenn. That's like no, that's that's fucking Glenn Keen right there. Do you do you remember a shift, or was that presence already kind of felt on Little Mermaid when you were there? Me, me, meaning like like when when, when did when did you, you guys, were able to? No, no. When did you guys? Or I should have you know articulated that a little bit better. When did you realize like oh shit, Glenn is different, right? Glenn is Glenn is like at the top of his food chain when it comes. Oh, to we, we, that, we we knew that. I mean, yeah. back from. Gosh, um, I think I became aware of this probably on Great Mouse Detective. You know, mm. when I was I was working in effects at the time, and um, just seeing the the scenes. You know, you you get to know you get, you go to dailies and you see the you know the 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 scenes come up on on the screen, and you can see who does what, and you would you know you pretty quick you learn who's good who you know who's good at what. Yeah. Glenn was good at pretty much everything. You know, Andreas, same thing. Mark, same thing. Um, other people, uh, this this guy is this guy's good at you know like kind of the close up, um, you know the like like kind of warm Real and warm and fuzzy stuff. Um, um, she's really good at the action stuff. Uh, this guy's good at the humor. Glenn was like he was good at all of it. Mm -hmm. You know, and and we'd see his stuff. Uh, he was doing Radigan at the time. You know, on, on Great Mouse, and it was like wow, this guy this guy kicks ass. So. Um, and you know, and, and even coming into it, like still fairly new to it, you'd see his scenes, his Radigan scenes versus those of his crew. It's like, oh yeah, you can tell the difference. You know, it's yeah. like this is this is trying to be Glenn. This is Glenn, and uh, yeah. So so we we knew. You know, it, it was you, you, we and we've said before, like animators are cast like actors. You know, mm -hmm. you you. Um, you you pick you pick the people you pick the people for the roles for the parts and was, oh, go ahead i'm sorry oh and, and and we knew he was a star you know we, we knew he was he was somebody that um he, he basically doesn't need to audition you know you 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 offer him the part and he takes it or not <laughs> it's it's funny because uh that that makes me um man i wish i wish i could remember who said this i might have heard this on a different podcast but it was like the only voice that mel blank ever had to audition for was oh shit what was his name we were just talking um pinocchio uh, he was the cat the only time um in oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. with honest john i can't fuck man that's gonna haunt me because it's gonna as soon as i hit end on this call gary the name is gonna come um, uh -huh. lucifer no lucifer was the kitten anyways um that mel I, blank, I know who you mean but yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I can't remember his name yeah. so mel blank the mel blank bugs bunny daffy duck you know pork right. egg, every looney tune you could possibly think of he, he right. that's the guy right ladies and gentlemen um and glenn keen or i'm um, excuse me mel blank it was like uh he, he had an audition for but then they didn't even use it right i they mean didn't. He, nope. they used like a hiccup or something they that used the hiccup and that's it and I'm, I'm sitting here thinking i'm like jesus christ you guys have the greatest in almost everybody's eyes voice actor of all time you have him it's like you have you, michael you, jordan you, and you don't the sound effect him. yeah you've got michael jordan but you're gonna send in 12th a third player on the bench like no we're not gonna use michael tonight i was yeah. like dude 
use this fucker. He's at your disposal. I, I just thought that was wild when you say the same thing with Glenn Keyes. Just put his name. He doesn't have to audition. He's got G14 classification. He's got clearance for sure, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, as we start to, you know, wind down towards the interview process of this or any of you part of this uh, podcast and we rotate into the fans questions, man, I've, uh, I've had a lot of fun um, talking Beauty and the Beast. So I can't wait to do have you back on and do the second movie um, sure. that you directed. Uh, but, you know, some wrap up thoughts before we rotate the fans questions, man. When you think of Beauty and the Beast, man, is there a scene or a image or a song or any part in this 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 movie where you think defines this movie? Um, I mean, for me, it's got to be the ballroom, you know, yeah. and, and, and it's it's there's a couple of reasons I say this. I mean, one, one of them is, you know, because this is what everything in the movie is leading up to, you know, mm -hmm. all the, the, um, the, the story, the character arcs, the emotion, the color, you know, everything is leading to the scene. And then you open the door and it's, you know, one of the, one of Disney's first like full CG environments that's moving around and James doing, you know, the, the, uh, the characters dancing in 3d and yeah, I mean, plus Angela's song, holy smokes you know it's it, it all came together it all worked and to have something like fire off on all cyl all cylinders like exactly the way it's supposed to and better yeah that's that's something you can you can hope for but but um you know like like you said earlier it's like you, you don't know you know yeah. we didn't know what we had we you know we were hoping but um yeah that's that's the one that's the one that came together and then the the other reason I I like that one there's a, there was a um, the Disney I don't know if they still do this or not I'm sure they do but but they do test screenings with like test audiences recruited audiences and, and we'll go out to a theater somewhere and Kirk and I since you know we're just like cartoon guys we we are not recognizable to the public you know we just like walk into the theater and we just like sit down you know and and so there's like people all around us and we're like kind of seeing what their reactions are. And the scene when the beast comes out at the top of the stairs and he's wearing, you know, that, that blue coat, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the door across from him opens up and Belle steps out in, in her yellow ball gown. And uh, they were like, like people were like, you know, whistling and like, woo. And, uh, and there's this girl sitting right behind Kirk and myself. She was probably like 18 or 19. And, she, and she, we could hear her go, she's just a cartoon. And we were like, ooh, oh, I tell you, a tough crowd, ooh. And, uh, and Rodney Dangerfield, that's the first time it's been done on the show. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate it. <laughs> and so, so, you know, we go through the, the, the opening song at, at the table, and then they go into the ballroom, and the doors open up, and, and the, um, you know, the, the, the digital ballroom comes on, and Kirk and I heard this girl go, holy shit. And we went, <laughs> yeah, we got her. <laughs> so that's that's when we knew. That's yeah. when we knew we had it. Oh, that's really cool. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> that should have been the crew t-shirt right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, <clears throat> so I, 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 my phone just shut off. I had the date pulled up. Do you remember the date, this movie? The, you remember the premiere, the date? <sighs> no, I think it was in November sometime, but I don't remember the, the exact date. All right, but I, I wanted I wanted to take you back, man. So so if you can get in the mindset for just a second, if you could put old Gary in that spot and say, "Man, premiere night, the movie ends, crowd or lights go black, lights start to come on." Excuse me, the credits start rolling. What was it like seeing Gary, co-director, Beauty and the Beast, with a crowd of people? What was that feeling like? It, it was pretty crazy. You know, I mean, th this is something, it's not something that I had aspired to I'll put mm -hmm. it that way. You know, when I, when I got into the business, it wasn't like, I, I'm going to direct, you know, I, yeah. I thought I'm just, you know, I'll be one of these kind of modern day monks that, il you know, il illuminates a manuscript, except, you know, we'll flip the pages back and forth and we'll move and I'll be doing that until I'm, you know, old and in a sweater vest and, you know, and, and, it's like this is what animators do and that's that's what i that's what i thought i was going to do mm -hmm. and things just took a turn you know and and to see my name like that and have people 
clapping at a um, at a cartoon. I mean, anytime an audience claps at any movie in a theater, it's like it's it's pretty weird. You know, it's yeah. like they're not, they're not there. You know, it's not it's not like the theater. You know, where there's live performers on stage. But um, we saw um, the New York Film Festival. We saw that. Um, we saw it went to Cannes and you got a reaction there. We took it on press tours to like to Tokyo and Milan and, you know, and just like all these places and people were liking it. And I was like, holy shit, this, this is nuts. Now, what was that high like? Cause I don't imagine. So just cooking for a living, you have adrenaline pumping, right? You've got all of these crazy hormones going, you've got all these emotions going. And then it's hard to come down after something like that, right? So what most people do is they turn to drugs, they turn to alcohol. Now, I'm not asking you if you turn to drugs or alcohol, but I, I just want to know, after that night, after you see your name, I got to imagine you're, like I said, you're flying high. How long did that last for? What was that happiness? I mean, was it just going from state to state, country to country? Was it just ever it going? Kind of, it kind of did. I mean, it was a little, you know, a little up and down, but, mm -hmm. but I mean, it, we rode that wave for a little while because this was the first time something this big had happened to Disney animation. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, they, okay. Earlier in production, we're, we're still in mid production and Brian McEntee, our, our uh, designer uh, came up to us and said, you guys, this, this movie is going to make a hundred million dollars. And we, I'm pretty sure we laughed in his face, you know, because, <laughs> because animation doesn't do that. You know, yeah. it, 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 to that point, Little Mermaid made 86 and that was like wildly successful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like Rescuers Down Under made like 32, um, Oliver and Company made 50, and that was considered a you know a huge success. And you know, for Brian to say you're going to make a hundred million dollars, that's crazy. You know, we're just trying to get this thing done on time, and and you know, thinking oh it's 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 going to be a hundred million dollars thing. So when it did, um, <laughs> Kirk and Don and I ran out and got a bottle of champagne, and we were going to like run up to Michael Eisner's office and go, hey, look at us, look what we did. Um, didn't Did you get to do that? that? Oh, well, no, well, damn! Well, we I was, went up there, and his and his secretary just stopped us cold. It's like, no, you can't go in. It's like, don't you understand what happened? And she's like, no, you can't. So she made us just kind of cool our heels, like in the lobby for, I don't know, like twenty minutes or so. It's like, what the fuck, man! And it's like hundred million dollars, and and then Michael's door opens up, and these two. giant guys in from the back it's like okay well, we get it <laughs> we're still just the cartoon boys oh my internet connection is unstable yeah it it, it uh it, it froze up a little bit there uh, oh, okay but yeah it, it'll be all right we could fix it okay um, um yeah so so i mean ultimately we went in and he was like yeah very good congratulations but um uh, <laughs> but yeah i mean it, it it gave us a little perspective. It was like, yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're doing so great. We did a hundred million dollars. And then, and then, you know, you see, Oh, and then Frank Wells came in and, and he just had a bill pass in the Senate. And we're like, all right, <laughs> here we are in grown up land, <laughs> you know, with our, you know with, our, with our little cartoon that made a lot of money, but it's still, it's a cartoon, you know, and, yeah. and uh, that's well, thank how you. it went. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I, I get, like I said, I just, I love hearing stories like that. You know, we've heard a few like seeing your name in the first credits time, uh, first first time seeing your name in the credits, excuse me. Um, so it's always interesting to see, you know, what people's experiences are like or what they were going through or what they did to celebrate. I really enjoy that. Um, but like I said, man, uh, we didn't go super, super deep into Beauty and the Beast because there's quite a few better fans or there are better people that wrote in, I guess is what I'm getting at. Um, right. So th they had some pretty, re they had some really good questions. Um, but before we get to those questions, man, there's two questions I always like to ask. You're Mount Rushmore, so you get four plus one. If you had to build a Mount Rushmore of your inspirations, animators, illustrators, who would be on Gary's Mount Rushmore? Animators, illustrators. Okay, I mean, number one, um, he's not an animator, he's a cartoonist. Uh, hmm. Sergio Aragones from okay. uh, Mad Magazine. You yeah. may or may not know who he is, but he was somebody that um, 
I've always found to be he's he's so clever and so funny and so concise and um I mean he's the guy that did those the, in if you're familiar with Mad Magazine out there um the the little cartoons in the margins mm-hmm. you know the, the no dialogue at all but you know exactly what's going on another one that I always loved was called the Shadow Nose mm-hmm. you know it'd be like a couple people in a some, kind of a mundane situation and then their shadows cast behind them on the wall like what's really going through their heads again no dialogue reads like a million bucks and i always you know his his quick storytelling one one frame you know conciseness it was a huge inspiration always has been um tex avery yeah. you know just just the nuttiness and the fun and the, just the, the crazy zaniness from from uh, his cartoons um chuck jones mm. similar you know like what what a great inspiration um I got to meet him um, yeah. early on, um, and he he gave me a, a piece of really good advice that um, I've I've carried with me, you know, basically for the you know my career was like, don't try and do everything yourself, you know, don't don't try and micromanage or be an auteur. He didn't use those words, but but basically, don't try and do everything your, yourself. You've got a crew that's really good at what they do. Let them do their job and they'll make you look good. That's and, smart. And they'll be happier and their happiness will show up on the screen. And I've, I've, I've always found that to be true. Um, and then as far as animators go, as much as, as much as I respect and admire Glenn Keane, James Baxter to me is mm-hmm. like probably the best living animator. Um, he's, he's somebody that I, if anybody deserves a statue of them, it's James. Yeah. Fine. And then honorable mention. Oh man. Um, you go all over the place here. Um, um, trying to think. Um, I mean, Jay Ward from the Rocky and Bullwinkle. He would be. He would be a really good one. And I had the opportunity to do a a Bowinkle short, you know, a few years back, which was a blast, you Mm -hmm. know, and and just like digging into all that stuff, crap animation and, you know, (laughs) just like rudimentary designs, but the writing was so good and the voice work was so good that it it still stands up, you know, so I'll I'll put Jay Ward in there. I'm so glad you bring it up because I don't get to have this, this chat with many people. Um, Have you ever read the book, The Moose That Roars? I I know of the book. I haven't read it. Man, you I'm just because you you brought up crappy animation, but outstanding dialogue. They had to make up for the crappy animation because they outsourced uh, they outsourced the animation. I believe to the first time it was in New Mexico. Mexico. You know, Jay was, yeah, Jay was trying to get it back to L.A. They just had they didn't have any kind of you know training down there. They didn't they weren't set up for an animation studio. So you right. hear all of the crazy shit that happened right. for the production of Jay Awards. You ha- you hear that Jay almost got killed. By getting hit by a truck you know you hear all of this crazy shit and you're like whoa because i was a huge rocky boy fan whenever i i've never really been able to sleep so I would stay up, watch cartoons and shit. And on Cartoon Network, they would play a lot of the Rocky and Bullwinkle show. You know, I'd see that. I'd see Peabody and Sherman. I love the fables, you know. So it was it was different than what I was yeah. watching. You know, this is before the cartoon boom car- for Cartoon Network. So Dexter's Lab wasn't really around. You know, right. they didn't start Powerpuff Girls. So this is what I would watch. I would watch the Looney Tunes. I would watch Tom and Jerry, the Flintstones, Flintstone Kids, Scooby-Doo. And then at nighttime when I couldn't sleep, you know, 11, 12 o'clock, Rocky and Bullwinkle would be on. So I love that studio. It, they had, even though it is horrible art uh, or horrible animation, excuse me, it, there's something fun about it. There's something special about seeing those two characters. Um, we, we worked with, um, with, with Jay's daughter when, when yeah. we were doing this uh, thing. And so she told us a bunch of these stories. And one of the ones we heard was that the, um, when they were in Mexico, they didn't really have any like, you know, cartoon art supply stores down there mm. um you know or, or art supplies in general and the paint they got was basically the mexican version of sherwin williams yeah. so so they were using like house paint that they were mixing you know to as best <laughs> they could to get the the colors so that's why everything's like a little bit muted you mm-hmm. know and, and, and the colors it's it's not because the film is old it's because they're using house paint 
That's really cool. I don't, I don't remember. I don't think I've ever heard that story. So it was really cool for you to share, man. We've had a lot of great stories, ladies and gentlemen. There's a lot of good stuff. And last one before we get to the fans' questions. Uh, two books that you think every fan of animation should have on their bookshelves. Well, I mean, there's the, the Frank and Ollie book, you know, mm-hmm. the, um, the, 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 um, illusion. the, the illusion of life, um, which we sometimes would call the illusion of work. But, um, <laughs> but um, I mean, that's, that's like, that's like almost a Bible, you know, for, for, for people in, in animation. Yeah. Just, just look at this. I mean, if, if nothing else, just for, you know, just look at the artwork, you know, then don't, don't, don't look at it as a, an instructional manual or, or anything like that. Just, just look at the pretty pictures. And the other one is um, Walt Disney and other characters by mm-hmm. Jack Kinney. Um, he was, he was like a, he was like a story guy back then. And he wrote this book. He did all these little, all these like funny characters and, uh, and, and wrote this, I guess it was like kind of a tell all, but, but, you know, just talked about Disney studios, you know, back, back in the day, back forties and fifties and all that. And talks about, talks about the people that work there, talks about the projects, talks about Walt. Um, it's a really good book. It's really entertaining. Um, one of the funniest cartoons, like single panel cartoons I've ever seen is, is in there where he's talking about um, um, Walt Disney is touring around Charlie Chaplin and I think Orson Welles. And, you know, he's, he's, he's touring them around the studio. This is Walt Disney Studios. This is where he made these beautiful movies. And here's the, here's the, um, uh, the music room where we made such beautiful music for the movie Fantasia. And he opens the door and it says, this is what they saw. And it's like two guys at the piano. One of them is bent over and the other one is lighting his farts. And that's, 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 what, that's what they walked in on. I must have laughed for 15 minutes solid when I saw that. So whenever, <laughs> whenever we release these episodes, we usually pull a clip out. We use a fruit uh-huh. and then we usually pull out a clip and we put that, we front load it to the front of this interview to, you know, to let people know what they're expecting or, you know, to like just draw somebody in right away. Um, that's for sure. That story is going at the beginning. <laughs> story. I'm so glad you told that story, man. And <laughs> first fan question actually comes from, from me. This is, this is something we've implemented for the last few months. Uh, that's been really fun because, you know, one person's led me to the next, led me to the next, led me to the next. So Gary, this is the animation recommendation. This is the part of the show where you get to say, hey, Julian, you guys should for sure reach out to X, Y, and Z. So who would you recommend? Maybe a colleague, maybe a friend that you think would have a great time on this show? I'd, I'd go with Kirk Wise. I mean, Kirk Wise. If, if, you, if you haven't, if you got, haven't got him yet, um, the two of us worked well together. Mm-hmm. Um, I always said he was the smarter one, so you'll get really good stuff from him. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he's 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 a really good interview. Uh, you've got you've got Chris Sanders before, right? Yeah, yeah. He's uh, he was on a few weeks ago. That dude is amazing. I wish I had his energy all day. Yeah. It is yeah. phenomenal. I mean, I'm pretty sure he might feel different because whenever you say, "I wish I could do what that person does," like you don't you don't want this. This is this. Is- <laughs> You don't want this <laughs> so uh, but like i said dude, he was so fun we 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 dove deep uh into lilo and stitch and everything yeah. and you know yeah. all of these different stories because i've heard so many chris sander stories so whenever his name came up that was like what's the what's the craziest chris sander story you got and he's like just one i gotta pick just one right I've right seven that come to mind <laughs> yeah so yeah he was he was a phenomenal guest but yeah we'll, we'll we'll reach out to kirk man um so first fan question here uh comes from i'm stalling because it fell down there we go uh sack and if i if i mispronounce your names I'm, i apologize uh from youtube sackner Fruel, i think uh who came up with the idea for the uh atlantean crystal necklaces and alphabet system this won't all just be beauty and the beast because the fan question right, right, right. for everything so i apologize for that one can i trip you out here is yeah. I, well, mrs Potts, <laughs> <talks> with, uh, <laughs> um god the crystals probably probably tab murphy you know the the, the writer mm-hmm. the screenwriter he he probably had you know, like in in his original screenplay the idea that you know the, the the big mother crystal and then everybody had like a little a little piece of it that you know they, they kept around their neck like as 
their little their little booster system. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the alphabet that was that was Mark Ockren, the guy that came up with the uh, with the language as well. Um, he was he's like the the he's he's a legitimate linguist, you know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we'd be say, oh yeah, Milo, he's a Smithsonian linguist. Mark Ockren is a Smithsonian linguist. Um, he's he's working. I think at the time his his kind of focused area of study was um, languages like dead languages from California Indian tribes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that of which there's not very many speakers left. There's a few maybe like wax cylinders, you know, to to like hear the words spoken. But but Mark was the one who wrote. And created the uh, the Vulcan language and the Klingon language of the Star Trek oh, wow. uh, canon, um, and yeah, we, he was he was willing to he was willing to do it, and he um, he did both. He didn't. I don't think he like quite designed you know the the, the letters for the alphabet, but we um, leaned on him heavily for like how they should be, how you know their, their structure he was saying you know when written language came about everybody had some really crazy ideas about it you know Mm -hmm. it was it was it was one of those things that like it wasn't around for god knows how many tens of thousands of years and all of a sudden everybody started to have written language at once but it was all really crazy different you know there was like there was like cuneiform and there was like carved sticks and there was beads and there was um hieroglyphics and just like everything all at once Mm -hmm. and and so he was the one that came up with like sentence structure grammatical structure um you know letters and repeating letters things like that so uh, mark awkward gotcha um yanola wants to know with beast character design how do you find the right balance of scary and appealing uh is it just a matter of trying designs until one feels right we had a hell of a time getting the beast design I mean, we, Chris Sanders, but funny, we should bring him up again. He, he was doing a lot of the design work, um, you know, for, for the characters on beauty. And he did oh, scores of different designs of, of um, I think a couple of them did end up as like on the alien, uh, you know, the alien court scene in uh, Lilo and Stitch, like the big, the big general, you know, with like the, the, yeah. that was that's reminiscent of one of his beast designs and you know some some of the others but he had avian and insect and like really furry and there was a rhinoceros in there somewhere mm-hmm. and like all these different ones and just, God, you know it's not really not really doing it and then he did the one um that was like part buffalo part wolf part boar you know that turned into the the beast and but we saw his design on that one that's the one that's yeah. that's what we want um, and then, you know, Glenn refined it and, you know, did, did his thing to it, you know, where he, some of it was, was like some of the, some simplification just for animation purposes. Um, and, and, and just for like facial readability. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of how it came about. It was, it was a lot of trial and error, you know, like hunting around, looking around what felt right. And then not just the design, but the voice casting for him was, was tough too, you know? So finding, once we found that look that we liked, finding a voice that when we're looking at this, at this drawing, the still drawing and, and listening to a voice from an actor that we can picture coming out of this drawing, that took a lot of doing too. I'm glad you brought up the voice actors because that was uh, something that was asked as well. John Olivius wants to know, do you have any fond memories in the recording booth of any of the actors? Does anyone stick out to you? All of them. I mean, we yeah. got so lucky with, with all of these guys. Um, probably, I mean, Angela was just such a sweetheart to work with. Um, Jerry was another one. I mean, what a gentleman um, and, and a pro. And when he when he first came in, um, Howard and Allen said, yeah, Jerry Orbach, he used to be an old song and dance guy from the 60s. You know, it's like, hmm. like, what? Law and order? That guy that, you know, the, this hard-boiled detective, he was like, he was a song and dance guy. Um, you know, so he like hooked right into the Maurice Chevalier kind of vibe that, that Lumiere had. Um, David Ogden Stiers was, was really fun. I mean, he was, he was just, <laughs> he, he, 
one of the fun things about him is is he oftentimes wrote his own lines and we really? encouraged any of the actors you know if you've got a better way of saying this or you think of something you know an, an, another way to do this line please go ahead but david just like took it and ran with it and for my money the best line and the, the funniest line in the film um was one was was by david and we would at his uh, uh, recording sessions, we'd say, okay, you know, this, this is what we do. And he'd come to a line and he'd go, just a minute. And he'd like, right, you know, for a few minutes. And then he'd perform like, like four or five different versions of, of our line, but you know, with, with, with his spin on them. So the one um, where Beast and Cogsworth and Lumiere are looking off the, uh, the balcony and there's Belle in the snow down below the horse. And the beast says, I want to do something for her. But what? And Cogsworth says, oh, there's the usual things, flowers, chocolates, promises you don't intend to keep. And that was that was David's line. And we we just died in the booth. It's like, ah, oh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Uh, uh, yeah, he was a lot of fun. I got to imagine, man. Uh, so thank you for sharing those stories. Uh, Hassan Hasnoi wants to know, uh, would you consider making an animated adaptation of Hunter's Moon, A Story of Foxes by Gary Kilworth? Is... Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, mean, I don't know it. I don't know it. But but um, you know, I'm I'm all for uh you know, adaptations and and uh and animation. Yeah, sure. I I'd, I'd need to I I'd need to read it first or see it or you know, what what version does it exist in now? Is it is it a book? Is it a like a graphic novel? Is it a film or a series? I'll have to check it out and then I'll let you know because I'm not okay. too cool. Uh, but yeah. Okay. Uh, Cir Circulation, I think three thousand wants to know. Um, he's like joke question if it's allowed. Uh, are you as slick as Gaston? Or are you as quick as Gaston? Is your neck as incredibly thick as Gaston? <laughs> <laughs> no no and no <laughs> uh, no one is burly and brawny <laughs> he's got biceps to spare uh this one was a fairly long question but i'm not going to uh ask it all um but person on reddit i'll uh, make sure i respond to you um, I want to set it up just a little bit, though. Uh, it said, Hunchback is one of my favorite Disney movies. The dark tone, a villain that you understand, uh, and the way it feels uh, way it feels real makes it very, very memorable. You and the rest of the team did an amazing job. Here's a few questions about it. I remember you uh, said something about James Baxter, so I thought this one was a pretty good one. Uh, would you have made the scene with uh, where Quasimodo climbs with Esmeralda with the camera spinning around if you didn't have James Baxter, Baxter on board? Um, and then uh, there was a second part to that one. It says, was this camera move an idea that sprung from seeing James's abilities to animate in perspective and the famous, because you brought this one back up or you brought this one up earlier uh, and the perspective in the famous ballroom dancing scene in Beauty and the Beast? I don't think, I don't think we, we moved. It. Well, I mean, again, this is, this is, it's a, it's a moment where, where a lot of, a lot of, things are coming to a head you know and that's that's kind of what we like to do um it for for us just because you can move the camera around doesn't mean you should unless there's a good reason to and this seemed to be a good reason mm -hmm. you know quasimodo's uh has, has broken free he's he's defied his master he's rescued esmeralda from the flames um and he's climbing back up to, to shot sanctuary i mean there's, there's a lot of shit going on here yeah. and to to encompass it all in one shot that moves around like that seemed seemed like a good idea at the time. And James, I mean, of course, he was he was a great person to do it. And he calls that scene his King Kong scene. You know, when he's, yeah. when he's like looking at the camera from under his arm, you know, you see his eye. And um, yeah, was, would we have done that the same way without James? Hard to say. I mean, I'm I'm. I know there's other animators that, that would have loved to have attempted it, but I don't think anybody could have nailed it quite like he did. Although, you know, it, it would have been worth a shot. James yeah. is, yeah, I mean, James is money in the bank. You, you know you're going to get it great. 
Yeah, I, I thought that was a very, very, um, very smart question. I, re I really enjoyed it. She had, uh, or he, I, I don't know, because I, I accidentally cut off the name when I did the screenshot. Uh, they had some real good questions, and we'll save some of those for the next time you're on. Um, this one's come up a couple times, but I'd be interested to pick your brain about it. Uh, Chug the Boommeister wants to know, great name. Uh, do you think uh -huh. the animation still has a future in Disney? Well, yeah, probably. I mm. mean, it's 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 difficult to say. I haven't been at Disney in a long time, you know, so I I don't know what their um, what their corporate structure, what their you know what their company wants or, or anything like that. Um, and they, <laughs> the cynic in me says, yeah, if, if they want to keep doing you know keep cashing in on live action remakes they're going to have to keep making animation first yeah. so um <laughs> how can we do an animation remake if we don't have the animation so um i think i mean roy is gone and and i, I don't know how many of the disney family are you know are, are, are still attached or consulted by by the studio when Roy was there, it was, it was very important. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, this is what built the studio and, and the studio had his name on it. So, it, you know, it was going to be, there was going to be animation. Um, I think there are still people there that feel that way. Um, that, you know, the, it's the heart and soul of the company. And absolutely. Um, that's what, you know, you go to the parks, you go to the, the hotels, you go to the cruise, whatever you've got mickey mouse and you've got stitch and you've got um you know bell. all, all, all the, the walk around characters bell. bell and goofy and you know donald duck and they're they're all walking around wouldn't have any of these without animation and i know they like to keep things fresh or at least they did i'm hoping they still do i would really like to see a return to 2d animation because i still there's a market for cg because not a lot of people like cg there's a market for something that's like rick and morty there's a market for something beavis and butthead is fucking coming back king of the hill was my favorite animated show probably of all time like that it was so far ahead of its time and that's making a comeback too there is a whole market for whatever if if you've got a like there i guarantee you there's somebody there that's got a plug that's trying to tap into tap into the stuff yeah. you like um this one was cool quoth the raven 713 wants to know um and i'm not a big video game person so uh, you may or may not be able to answer this one in beauty and the beast the prince is never given a name but he's called prince adam by uh fans due to him being given the name in a cd-rom do you consider that name canon for him since you never gave him one or do you have another name in mind i've i've uh i've, I've fielded this question on facebook you know i'm like some oh yeah on there yeah um no he's not named prince adam um I, I remember the first time i saw that um and i i emailed don hans the fuck is this who's adam and he said well apparently and it was what kingdom hearts i think is the game or one of those where the um you know they, they said well we gotta call him something you know so they came up with the name we didn't name him not because we didn't want to, but because it just didn't occur to us. Like I said, we were we were under a very tight schedule, and he wasn't a human until like the last like three minutes of the show. And weird as it sounds, we were going through the film more or less um, sequentially, so we didn't get to the last few minutes of the show until the last few weeks of production. And it was everybody's hair was on fire, and you know it was all hands on deck, and we're running around in circles and. And um, <laughs> and somebody said, I think it was Brenda said, "What is she going to call him? You know, when she's about to kiss him, um, she can't just call him Beast." And we're like, "Oh shit, we never thought of that. <laughs> we never gave him a name, and we didn't have time to like have you know a seven-hour conference meeting where we all sat around a conference table and oh, should do this or should do Jean Pierre or no, is he French? No, we don't know." And and um, I know we uh, we put up a list, like kind of a name the beast as as a human prince contest, like by the coffee machines, and you know people would just come and they'd like write down the list. Um, it's like you know you you see you see these things where people say, "I need a name for my dog," you know, and and, and suggestions. 
So we had um, Bob Beast and Bubba Beast and, you know, <laughs> all, all those. And none of them, none of them really stuck. You know, I mean, um, God, what was, what was the name? I'm pretty set on Bubba Beast. If we're Hector being a- Alessandro Mountain Dew Camacho the Third. Jesus Beast, Christ. was probably my favorite. But, um, <laughs> Um, do you have one that fits if you could if you could pull the trigger and say hey that's his name do you have one that that really speaks to you oh I, I no I don't and, and I and I never really thought of it you know since since we didn't name him and then the film whoop, went out you know into the world we said okay that's that you know I'm, I'm not gonna like retrofit him now yeah. um, You're not gonna George Lucas it huh right. <laughs> <laughs> right the beast shot first um <laughs> So no, I mean, I will say he's not Adam, but yeah. Um, yeah. but no, we we never gave him a name just because we we ran out of time and and the movie came out and and we kind of kind of got away with it and you know until like like uh, like like your your viewer said it um, it showed up in a game and they had to name him yeah. so but yeah we were not consulted nor did we agree with this decision well, listeners and watchers yeah what, what name you would want the beast to be called uh, it'd be interesting to see uh whenever i do something like that i'm always i'm always amazed and shocked and aghast <laughs> all in once uh <laughs> at what at what i read it's 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 an interesting community man but i love you guys for listening and watching um this has been a real blast and a real treat for me i'm really glad that uh ladies and gentlemen if you listen this long this probably wasn't going to happen today but i was like fuck it i'm just going to drink as much green tea and honey as possible i'm going to eat as much weed as i possibly can when i get home and we're going to have this talk so if uh my voice has been especially screeching or grating tonight i apologize um but uh this has been like a real blast for me man i i I, uh I didn't know how far, how in depth we would go but i'm really glad that we got to sit down and uh converse about Beauty and the Beast, this movie doesn't happen. Uh, there's a lot of things that don't happen after this one. I mean, Aladdin does get made. You don't have Lion King. You don't have Mulan a few years ago. Pocahontas is in there as well. So you, you guys were the next step after Little Mermaid. You guys took what the Little Mermaid did, and you took it a mile further. And then the next people, a mile further. You guys progressed Disney. You guys brought out animation. Because for the longest time, Till Roy came back in, they 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 were considering like we were just talking about considering getting rid of animation, and it feels like that kind of that kind of thought process might be coming back because they just see animation as a kid thing, right? They don't really see the heart and soul that that adults are taking from this stuff. So there's lessons for little kids and there's lessons for adults in these movies. Um, to sum it up, man, uh, when you hear the name Beauty and the Beast, is there a word? Is there a phrase? Is there a sentence? Is there a motion? Is there a thought that goes through your head whenever you hear that term, Beauty and the Beast, or you hear that film that your name's attached to, Beauty and the Beast? I mean, when I, when I nowadays when I hear it, since there have been there was like the uh, you know the live action remake since then, I still think of the of the of the cartoon. You know, I still think of the yeah. animated version as you should. Um, yeah. That's to me. That's you know that. The, what came after it, you know, and, and the sequels, Bell's Magic Christmas and whatever, you know, came after it's like, yeah, whatever, do it, do what you want. Um, this, this one, you know, this, this is the one I, I helped with. And, Original uh, flavor Coke is what you got, Gary. Yeah. I mean, we did it. We did a, um, um, what do you call it? An augmented version where, where we put in the song human again um that was not in the original theatrical release and i and i do like that a lot too so but what's the thought that goes to your head though when you think about it when i think about beauty and the beast yeah or is there a is there a memory <laughs> it was that... half a lifetime ago i mean half literally a half a lifetime ago yeah it was, it was um what is it 30 31 years now yeah i'm 62 so uh yeah it's that's that's what it is that's how it is to me thinking and thinking in terms of uh cartoon time um production schedules yeah half a lifetime 
That's beautiful, man. Uh, well, Gary, where can fans go to come and say, hey, man, I really liked that thing you did that that time, you know. Uh, you did it three times with a lot of these, and we'll get the other two the next time you're on. Well, we'll probably do one and one, um, but we'll get the other movies eventually when, when we have to back on, man. Uh, but if you uh, if fans want to come by and say, hey, not, not at your home, but on the social media, man, where can they come and find you to see what Gary's working on next? I'm on, I'm on Facebook. Um, I'm on Instagram. Um, I have a web page, which I never can remember what it is because I'm not on there that often. It's <laughs> Gary Trousdale one dot com, I think. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll have all those links in the description below so people can come over yeah. and you know, they click on the link, they can go see Gary and they can say, Hey, Gary, man, I like that movie, The Beauty and the Beast. It was fun. Um, you know, because like I said, we had a lot of, lot of questions about Atlanta. So I'm pretty sure uh, we All might right. jump out of, jump out of, uh, out of turn as far as what movies came next. That's fine. Uh, I'm up yeah. for it. Yeah. John, Pom when I had John Pomeroy, he said that, that was one of the ones he wanted to revisit when he came back on. He was like, Cause that was a highlight of my life. John, uh, John was so good. And w when we went on press tours at, uh, for Atlantis, he had put together like a little um, uh, like like a little talk on how to draw Atlantis, a little a little training talk. So he he would say, okay, here you draw like this and like this and these two big circles and then and basically and he was having the reporters draw Milo, yeah, you know, for for uh, you know for for his interviews. And he got, I mean, I was that's the closest I've ever come in my career to drawing any character on model was when John. <laughs> taught us how to oh that's fucking great what a great way to end this podcast uh he's been gary i've been julian this has been the what's in my head podcast and this has been another piece of your childhood good night my guest next week is the author for my favorite book of the year mr jake s friedman jake wrote the disney revolt the great labor war of animation's golden age phenomenal told me something really interesting that his wife margie was, who was working in the HR department at the time, which was called the personnel, the uh, personnel department. She was working right under this guy named Hal Adelquist, and he shows up in the book. Hal Adelquist basically became the anti-union witch hunter for the Disney company. He also had been at Art Babbitt's wedding because his wife and Babbitt's wife were best friends. And so they vacationed together. So they had this personal tie. and. Now he's like trying to like hunt unionists. And when the strike is over, uh, it was rumored that he kept different files for the staff who were once strikers and who were non-strikers. So Don Lusk says at age 101, he tells me that Margie, his wife, who's deceased, told him that, uh, all the, per, all, all, the, all the staff were separated in, in the files from strikers and non-strikers and the people, whenever it was time to lay someone off, the people who would for, be first to lay, be laid off would be the ex-strikers. And I was like, that's, that's, that's interesting. And that's totally something that could be made up, <laughs> right? Yeah. There's no way to prove that. Um, and that sounds like something that, that people who had been embittered by the strike would start spouting and start to like, you know, smearing the Disney company with. Uh, but it could be true. I had no way of proving it. And I can't put something like that in the book. Yeah. As, as juicy as a detail that might be, there's no way to back that up. But then... But wait, hold, there's more. But <laughs> hold that phone over in the cane maker collection at at Bope's library there's there are a whole bunch of files that John Kmaker had gotten from Dave Smith back in the 70s and back then Dave Smith was head of the archives the Disney archives and uh, he was a lot more open about what things could be shared and among them are like 12 or 15 uh, employee evaluations and they're brutal, like really harsh, <laughs> really nitpicky and like insulting the stat, like their character. And above the photo of each employee is one of two words, striker or non-striker, written in pencil.